Well, good evening, and welcome to another episode of Copernic's Friday Night Livestream. Uh, my name is Drew Desker. I'm the director at Copernic. Uh, very happy to, to have you uh, with us this evening on, uh, on a topic that's not astronomy, but uh, very interesting uh, nonetheless. And um, for those of you who may be watching us for the first time, uh, we are the Copernic Observatory and Science Center. We're an informal STEM education uh, center and public observatory in Vestal, New York. And normally on a Friday night, we would have a room full of people up here to uh, take in a program of some aspect of science or engineering or technology. Uh, but since last May, uh, sorry, last March, we've been unable to do so safely. So we've been we've sort of pivoted and started doing live streams, and they've actually become very popular. We may find ourselves even when we get uh, people back, uh, you know, back here uh, on site. Uh, still to be able to continue these live streams because we actually do sometimes uh, draw people from uh, across the country. Um, again, we Copernic is a uh, informal STEM education center. We um, we are a nonprofit. Uh, if you like what you see and uh, uh, are in a position to do so, uh, down in the description in YouTube, there's a little uh, donate uh, button that you can click and offer some support. Uh, just to let you know about a couple of things that are that are coming up. Uh, again, tonight's uh, program on uh, the Singers of Summer Cicadas. Uh, actually, later this evening at 9 o'clock, uh, Jeremy Carty, our live stream observer, uh, uh, astronomer, is actually going to uh, do a new, uh, he'll start a new live stream uh, and do some live observing. We've got, it's forecasted to have clear skies tonight, so we're looking forward to uh, having uh, Jeremy do a little uh, investigation of what's, uh, what's going on in the spring, spring skies through our telescopes. Uh, there will actually be a, uh, an ISS pass, International S uh, uh, Space Station pass. For those here in the, in the, in the southern tier, if you want to look out, you go out about uh, uh, 924, and if you look at the, um, in the southeast, I'm sorry, the southwest, it, it will be coming above the horizon about 924. Uh, it'll peak in the southeast at about 930, at about 30 degrees, and then it'll set in the northeast about 934. So uh, if you aren't watching Jeremy, in fact, Jeremy actually may try to try to catch it in the uh, in the scopes. Uh, next Friday, our program is going to be uh, 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 two gentlemen from the National uh, Weather Service in Binghamton uh, doing a Skywarn Storm Spotter training program. Uh, then on um, on Saturday, May 22nd, we are going to be doing our Rocket Fest, and actually you see some rockets here. We actually sold out Rocket Fest, and uh, it was interesting. Normally, we have people come up here to to build rockets and then uh, on the same day launch them. Um, this year, we've taken a hybrid approach where people actually pick up their rockets in advance, and they're going to come up over the day and launch our rockets. So we're looking forward to that. We'll have over a hundred of these rockets that will will launch over the day. Then uh, finally, on May 28th, uh, Zoe Lerner Ponterio from Cornell's uh, spacecraft imaging uh, facility up in Cornell will do a program called Navigating the Solar System. Now, for those of you who've got children or grandchildren in the area and um, uh, are looking for a summer camp opportunity, Copernic is going to be doing on-site summer camps. We have 11 different uh, uh, summer camps that will be uh, happening this summer, uh, two of which are actually already filled up. Uh, we're also offering some uh, vir uh, virtual camps for those that want to do that. And finally, uh, last bit of information, our Copernic Kids, this, uh, this sort of science exploration uh, program for uh, kids from 3 to 6 years old, will start June 12th. And so all the information about our, our camps and what's going on are, can be found on our website. Well, again, um, you know, people ask me, you know, how do you find all these speakers and, and uh, for, uh, for for talks? And... Uh, uh, and why, you know, how do you come up with these topics? And quite frankly, I'd say half of the top, half of the topics are just things that I'm personally interested in. And, and uh, uh, actually, I happen to know Lee through sort of a, another aspect of our lives uh, of music. And um, and when I heard about the the cicadas, you know, brood brood ten, brood X, whatever you want to call it, uh, coming up, uh, I said, you know, that sounds like an interesting topic. And so I reached out to Binghamton University, and they connected me with Julian and Carol. And um, I'm just so happy you could join us here this evening. Um, we've got 20 people watching. Now, we're going to hold our questions uh, to the end of the presentation. Uh, but if you go to the YouTube chat, go ahead and put, uh, put your question, any questions you might have in, in that YouTube chat, and we'll pass them along uh, at the Q&A portion of this, uh, this event. So anyway, 
Dr. Shepard, Dr. Miles, it's it's up to you. Thank you much. Look forward okay. to this. So, um, okay, greetings, folks. Uh, my name is Julian Shepard, and I've taught entomology, which is the science of insects, uh, for many years at, at uh, B Binghamton University, and taught many other things, too. And I've taught uh, courses in zoology with uh, Carol Miles here. So um, we both coordinated. Um, Carol Miles will tell you that she also works with insects and particularly with insects that make sound. That's why she's such an appropriate contributor to this program. Um, okay, um, are you seeing my screen, I hope, which says Singers of Summer? Yep, um, yeah, we're, you were seeing the, we're seeing the uh, PowerPoint uh, prior to uh, uh, going into presentation mode, yeah. Good, okay. That's my best attempt at poetry, uh, Singers of Summer, and... Um, my subtitle here is Cicadas Can Count the Years, and that's a remarkable thing. But um, the uh, I think a lot of you know cicadas. They're, they have that shrill sound, which you hear around here coming in about July 1st or so. And it's that very high buzz, which I'll play for you, hopefully, in a few minutes. And... Um, what they're doing is those are the male cicadas actually signaling uh, for females. And uh, you may think it's a shrill, perhaps annoying sound, um, but the females uh, think it's a good thing and go looking for the males. The, um, um, <clears throat> the famous group of cicadas are the 17-year cicadas. And actually, they're not all 17 years, but I'll talk about that. Um, they do count 17 years and then almost magically appear in enormous masses. And so they've been noticed for a very long time. Um, I'll say right now, we don't know exactly how they count the 17 years because it's a pretty good trick. And I'll explain why uh, shortly. Now, cicadas have long been very popular. Um, the Greeks and Romans put them in cages uh, to hear them sing, and I think a lot of particularly East Asians actually still do that. Um, they, uh, and I sort of put up here on the screen Aesop's fable, uh, the famous Socrata that sang all summer and the ant that worked collecting food, and then Aesop makes a fable of it by saying, in the fall, Cicada says, ant, give me some food, and ant says, nope. Uh, go sing and dance as you did all summer, and uh, you can see what the fable is there. Um, okay, actually, I'm going to share my full screen here, and I hope that's uh, good for everybody. Um, now, the big event that's happening this year that's in the news is that some of the 17-year cicada, cicadas, which we call brood 10, by the way, that's not brood X, that's brood 10. Uh, for, they've named the broods, and I'll explain broods later, but they've named them by their U Roman numeral numbers. Um, quite why, I'm not sure, but uh, somebody started that and it's persistent. And that starts actually this week in the south and east. Um, they should already be coming out. I haven't actually seen the news. Um, but let me just uh, sort of give you one downer, and that is that we're not going to see them here. Uh, this brood 10 uh, exists to the south of us, actually not very far, um, about 60 to 80 miles south of here. Uh, the brood is there. And it's also east of us, over in the Hudson Valley in Connecticut. Um, but they aren't here, and actually we don't have any 17-year cicadas um, here. Um, I do want to talk about them because it's a fascinating and unique phenomenon. It's only in eastern North America that we have these uh, cicadas um, that count the years, um, and it's of interest to uh, people all over the world. Uh, since it's the only place here. And uh, there's not another kind of insect among the millions of species of insects that I know of that have this kind of very long-term rhythm. 
But I will talk about those later because I do want to champion the cicadas we do have. And those are called the annual cicadas or dog day cicadas. And uh, I rather like their scientific name, so I put that up. It's Neotobison lyricin. And you can see the, the root of lyricin um, celebrating their songs. Um, the hours come out in, as I said earlier, in the dog days of summer. That's why they're called. And I guess most of you know what we mean by dog days. It's those hot, sweaty days when actually you want to spend some time inside, probably. Um, although now we're wishing for those days. Um, and the song that they made is a very loud buzz. And, um, I'm going to just break the um, PowerPoint for a minute and um, uh, and put on the web. And if I'm very lucky, I will get um, uh, this song for you. And so let me uh, just go to the web, uh, plug this in. And if we're lucky, we'll get a nice little um, song for you here. Um, so... Okay. Um, is this being shared with you? Are you guys yep. seeing it? Yep. We, we can see it. As Excellent. long as you got your computer shared. Okay. That's here right. is one of our cicadas, the dog day cicadas. And here it goes. There's about a minute of song here. It's a long song. And you can hear others in the background. This is close up. It sounds at a distance. It sounds much more continuous. But it certainly for me sort of brings up the whole image of summer because they don't come out until about July 1st. Okay, I think he's done his thing. Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> and let's go back to the uh, PowerPoint here. Um, so, am I? Is the screen showing, Drew? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, yes, it is. We. Yeah. You. You just need to go back to uh, okay. the slideshow. Yeah. Okay. So. At this point, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Miles in to tell us how they do sing. So, uh, Carol, are you ready? Yeah. Let right, me you, you just need to stop your sharing, yeah, Julian, and uh, and let Carol share. There we go. All right. Two. All right. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Hold on a second. Before I start sharing it, I just have a couple things to say. So, yeah, how do the cicadas produce their sound? And this is something that people have been interested in for a very long time. Uh, the first attempt at describing the sound production mechanism uh, showed up in 1600 by a guy named Caserius. Uh, it's written in Latin, so I haven't read it. But uh, more commonly, the very first investigation is attributed to Ramur in 1740. I also haven't read that either, sorry. But the one that I have read is the real definitive work that's gotten the more recent, um, is the basis of the more recent studies on cicadas and how they make their sound. And that was uh, done by J.W.S. Pringle in 1953 and 1954. He published these papers. And he really got into the structure and physiology of how sound was produced in the male cicada. And in a little bit, I'll show you a couple of his drawings, which are very nice. So in the cicada, the um, sound is produced by a pair of little drum heads called timbals. Okay, so I think you can see this. So this is a picture of the cicada. And um, the timbals are chitinous membranes that are reinforced with a parallel array of stiffer ribs. 
and the timbals are located on the animal <clears throat> around the junction between its thorax and abdomen. And they're not small. Um, I mean, they're small relative to your ears, but they're not small relative to the animal. And you can actually see them if you catch a cicada, but you have to look under the wings to spot them. So this is a cicada whose wings have been removed. And here's the timbal organ right here. And you can see that it's this pretty large um, drum head with a parallel array of rib-like structures through it. And these are reinforcements right there. Okay, so the timbal itself, as you can actually kind of see it in this picture, it looks like it's kind of curved outwards, right? So it's a little bit of a curve to it. Um, and so basically sound is produced by um, the timbal when a muscle that's attached to the inside side of it contracts and it pulls the timbal inwards. And when it does that, um, when it does that, the ribs kind of resist the movement until they suddenly buckle and then it pops inwards. And then when the muscle relaxes, all the ribs pop out together. So the muscle pulls it in and actually when the muscle pulls in the timbal, the ribs pop in starting from the back. So they sort of do it in a sequence. So they sort of go and uh, then they all pop out together. And um, behind the timbals are a pair of large air sacs, one on each side of the, of the bug. And they take up most of the abdomen inside, uh, in the inside of the abdomen. And they work to amplify the sound. So um, they take the clicking of the timbal and they make it a lot louder. And they operate similarly to how the hollow body of the guitar or violin would amplify sounds. Uh, from the movements of its strings. So they're resonators that, uh, that uh, amplify that sound. So the air sacs are designed to resonate with the typical frequency that the timbal wants to produce, but they also have little muscles on them that can adjust uh, their stiffness a little bit um, and uh, change the resonance if the bug wants it to. So the sound amplified by the air sacs then exits the animal by way of a, a porthole down here by the um, uh, this area, the perculum, which is actually where their ears are, because, you know, they got to have ears if they're going to hear the sounds that others produce. So cicadas not only make sound, but they hear sound. Cicadas can be really loud. The 17-year cicadas that we're all excited about um, can produce sounds of 80 to 85 decibels, which is about as loud as a garbage disposal or a blender. And some of them can produce sounds uh, that are over 100 decibels, which is like a motorcycle, a power lawnmower, or a jackhammer. And that's pretty loud and amazing for a little bug like this. It's a big bug, but it's a little animal, right? So um, I want to talk a little bit about the muscles. So the timbals are moved by this muscle that pops the timbal inwards, and then when it relaxes, they pop back out. And there are a pair of muscles, one for each timbal, and they're very big muscles. And um, the next slide. Hello. Hmm. Why is it not? doing it. That's odd. Wait a minute. Sometimes I can't make it advance, Carol, if I don't click on the screen. Yeah, I'm clicking on the screen. Good. Oh, on the screen? Yeah. Carol, huh. you might try your uh, uh, left and right arrows on the Good. keyboard. Yeah, I tried that. Okay. Didn't work. Well, I can go to my other screen. Hold on. All right. I'm sorry. This is taking way too long. No. Ah, ta-da! I don't know what I did, but there it is. So um, this is a couple of pictures from a recent study. This is a CAT scan, actually, of a cicada. And it shows you the position of the timbal muscles, okay? And these ends of it are attached to the uh, timbal 
And then this is attached to a very strong support rod inside the cicada. So this is a view from the top, and this is the view from the side, and you can see they're pretty big. This is a view if you cut the abdomen off of the cicada and you look at it from the back end, so from the tip of the abdomen, abdomen looking up this way, you can see here's the giant muscle, and this is actually the membranes of its ear. Up here is where the air sacs are, so there's a lot of space dedicated to those. It's hard to actually visualize the air sacs because they're very thin membranes, and whenever you cut into something, they just collapse but they're up here. Okay, that's nice. Um, so the air sacs make the, uh, the um, let's, use it. let's see if it uh, does another, oh, come on. All right. So this is a drawing from uh, Pringle's work in 1953. And this is a drawing of the way things are organized. Uh, so this is an anterior view. This is looking from the front end of the bug into the abdomen. And here's the great big timbal muscles. They're attached to the timbals right here and here. And then the air sac is right here. And then, on. all right. So this then is the um, view like the, uh, the the photograph I just showed you where here's the muscles, you're looking from the butt end of the cicada up towards the front. And here's the great big timbal muscles, here's the ear, eardrum, and here is the large air sac that's surrounding it. So the air sacs are the resonators uh, and amplify the sound that the timbals make when the muscles pop them in and out. So that's cool. Um, there is something special about those muscles though. The cicada song uh, for the magic cicada, the 17-year cicada, is about 4,500 hertz or 4,500 cycles per second. And that means that the popping in of the ribs has to go at a rate of 4,500 pops per second. Now, oh. each contraction of the muscle causes a cycle of the ribs popping inwards. And so what happens is um, as those ribs go from back to front, they uh, put in that frequency, uh, they move at that frequency. Uh, well, I guess I should say the period of time between each rib buckling is at about that frequency. So that helps. But the muscle itself does not have to contract at 4,500 cycles per second as the sequ sequential activity of the ribs kind of divides that up. But here is... Um, Here is the, the sound that is that Pringle reported. This is the sound produced by a single popping in and out of the timbal. So you get these waves here, and there's a, a little ringing when the, when, the, uh, timb when the timbal pops out. So here it's popping in, and here it's popping out. Although the muscle doesn't have to contract at 4,500 cycles per second, uh, it does have to contract very quickly to keep this song going. So this is a single pulse from one cycle of the muscle uh, contracting and relaxing, but there are many, many pulses and they go on for, some of them can go on for a very long period of time. And so the timbal muscle has this special feature that it can actually contract and relax in only two and a half thousandths of a second. It's very fast, very fast contraction and relaxation. By comparison, your fastest twitch muscle takes a hundred thousandths of a second to go through the complete cycle of contraction and relaxation. So this moves 40, 40 times faster. It's a super muscle. So you think you have fast muscles, they have really fast muscles. And it can go through this whole cycle um, repeatedly for extended periods of time. So how does the muscle do that? Well, I'm not gonna get into the details of how muscles work, but um, basically whenever a muscle twitches, there are muscle proteins that slide past each other. And what gets them to, to do that is a stimulation from a nerve. So a nerve comes in and it provides an electrical signal that spreads through the muscle. And then when that electrical signal spreads through the muscle, the muscle proteins slide past each other and you get a twitch. And um, the cicada timbal muscle is different. Um, it doesn't need a nerve impulse every time it wants to contract. 
Instead, the muscle proteins are stimulated to move whenever the muscle gets stretched. So in the case of the timbal, the muscle contracts, it gets a nervous impulse and it contracts and it pulls the timbal in and then it starts to relax and the timbal pops back out again and it stretches the muscle, which stimulates it to contract again and again and again. So you can get this extended activity at a very high frequency. And not to get into too much entomology here, but um, this is not unique to the timbal muscle. There are insects that use a similar kind of muscle for flying. So for example, flies and bumblebees and some beetles, these big squat heavy insects, they use muscles like this so that they can move their wings fast enough that uh, they can actually get off the ground. So this is a cool kind of insect muscle that I would argue is superior to your muscle and my muscle. And uh, it's sort of a super fast twitch muscle. And so this kind of muscle moves that timbal in and out at something like 300 times a second. And uh, coupled with the sequential action of the ribs buckling in each cycle and the resonance of the air sacs, these little guys can make a very loud, really fairly high frequency sound. And so I will go back to, I will end it there and we'll go back to Shepard to tell us more things. Okay. All Let right. me go back to my screen here. And um, let me just tell you a little bit more about our dog day cicadas because we will see them here in July. Um, while sitting in the treetops, um, you might think these guys are just living for a short while, like the Aesop fable implies, um, but actually they live uh, several weeks and they do actually suck plant juices. And uh, they have a beak here, which I put in the middle of this uh, frame here, uh, which you don't see because it's, it's curved back underneath uh, the bug here. Uh, but they use that to actually pierce into the wood of these trees. So it's a pretty effective beak. And you might think, oh, it must be made of steel or something. No, it's not. But it's made of some pretty hard stuff. And they work it in and they suck the juices that are running up and down inside the bark of the tree. And they get a whole lot of water and not too much nutrients. It's like you trying to live off a diet of... Um, of, uh, you know, dilute orange juice or something. So what they do is they periodically pee. And I actually got a lovely picture here of a cicada peeing. They kind of twist to the right here. So uh, you can say you've seen an insect pee. That's definitely um, the first time I've seen an insect pee. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, they're beautiful flyers. They actually are not terribly strong flyers uh, because they've got a lot of weight. Um, but, the, well, I shouldn't say they're not strong, but they're not, they can't go long distances. Um, but just speak, I actually had this slide to show how wings of insects move. And this is a cicada and you see they're lovely. They move up and down, but notice the winds flex as they do. And that's actually a secret of flight that uh, humans have been trying to, uh, uh, imitate, uh, but so far really haven't succeeded. Uh, you know, our aircraft generally have still blades uh, that don't flex like this, uh, but the flexing allows them to uh, maneuver in flight and to go up and down and forward. They mate um, in response to the male's call, and the female will spend several weeks uh, laying eggs and what she does is she uses a device at her tail end to push into the bark here and lays little strips of eggs here. Um, the uh, I'm going to blow this up here for you a little bit and um, and just show you what these look like. Uh, these eggs here they're deposited in these little tubes, and I don't know why, but they make a separate two tubes here, and then these are all the eggs here. And they do lay a lot of eggs. Uh, the eggs get up to four or 500. Um, so uh, they do, um, uh, actually they can reproduce a lot. 
Um, so, uh, the eggs do hatch. They hatch a few months later. They hatch into tiny nymphs, which immediately fall to the ground. And maybe I'll blow this up once again, just to show you. Uh, this is, a, oh dear, uh, this is actually an old um, drawing of one of the first nymphs. We rarely see them because they're very small, uh, but they drop down and you see he's got a nice beak here. He also has his forelegs here are clearly a, an excavating device because that's what they do. They burrow down several inches to even more than a foot in the soil and then they attach to um, roots and spend a while down there. You might have noticed that I originally called them annual cicadas because we do see them every year. But actually, uh, that's because they have overlapping generations. It actually takes a couple of years or even more for them to develop all the way to the adult. But then what they do is they crawl out here. And uh, let me put this back on full screen here. They crawl out here up anything that's available. And this shows much the same thing on the right here. And then the adult actually pulls out of this. And by the way, they've gone through about five stages underground molts, but the last stage climbs up like this, crawls out, and there's the adult. This is a young adult, doesn't look the same as the ones I told you, because what happens over the next hour is they actually change color, they darken and harden. And uh, then they're ready to do all the things that um, I was talking about earlier, the singing and the mating. Okay, that's our annual cicadas, and I sort of wanted to tell you about them and what their life cycle is. The life cycle of the periodical cicadas, as we call them, is considerably longer, but obviously they're, they're actually slightly smaller than our dog day cicadas, but they, um, uh, but they take a lot longer to emerge. And what that means is they really could emerge within two years, but they don't. They space it out. Now, we call them periodical cicadas because they are every 17 years up here in the north. But down in the south, it's every 13 years. Um, you great mathematicians out there will realize, oh, my gosh, 17 and 13 are prime numbers. And there's something to that, which I'll talk about later. I will just emphasize, and by the way, the periodical cicadas are all called magic cicada, which I kind of like too. They are magic. Um, the phenomenon is unique in the world, and it happens only here. So um, it's uh, nice to be sort of host to such a remarkable phenomenon. And when they do come out every 17 years, they come out in enormous numbers. And... Um, uh, I've got another clip here, which I would like to show you. Um, this is a, a YouTube clip. And uh, this is actually the famous David Attenborough on planet Earth. And um, he's uh, got, I've got about a four minute clip here just showing the uh, periodical cicadas. Um, so let's, if we're lucky. We will get it here, and uh, hmm. uh, sorry about that. That doesn't seem to be quite right. Um, but I have a bunch. Yeah, here. no, I guess it's it's. Um, you're just getting that ad before it, so, so we just have to sort of. Oh, I see. That's a stupid ad. Yep. Okay. So I think if you close, yeah, close that window, go back to the other one, and just hit back one. That wasn't there when I tried it out, folks. So, uh, we just, it was called this live theater. We'll be there in a minute. Um, so stop share. Let's just go to here. Man. Job. In the you can take a sunrise, <laughs> sprinkle it with the dew, 
Mantids will eat anything that moves. All right, now go ahead oh, and share that. Goes. There you go. Including other mantids. Here goes David. I would like to get rid of this screen, but. Sorry, I'm trying to get rid of this ad. It's a pop-up. I should have gotten rid of pop-ups. But... How do we get rid of this? This tiny insect is yeah, go ahead and share that. from predators lurking in the undergrowth. Oh, darn. He's on, but we're not there. Yeah, because you haven't shared the screen. Oh, share screen. Okay. Whether an individual matters. It's not a screen you want to see at the moment, it's unfortunately. The chance. Whether it's spotted by predators. Whether it turns right or left. Okay. Let's go back here. Oh. Sorry, folks. I don't feel so bad anymore. <laughs> no, right. you, you should have seen some of our, of our earlier live streams when we first started doing this. Trust me, you're, <laughs> you're in good company. <laughs> Something in the, uh, the, uh, in space is doing that. I know it is. You yeah. should be looking. <laughs> it's intervention, huh? Something cosmic. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try once more because David is wonderful, and uh, but I can I can do without him, much as I love him. You know, now don't do that. Okay. Uh, start that, and then it'll say skip. What a lawn that looks like this. But your lawn looks a little bit more like this. You should click right here and check out True there Green. Go. With a look. There you go. After 17 years. Oh, here we go. Now, uh, I will share this screen with you. Great. Um, we have it now. The nymphs here. of the periodical cicada have been hiding their time. Now they march like zombies towards okay. the nearest tree. Here he goes. And stop. Now, this looks dark, but... Um, it's uh, it's because it is dark. <laughs> At first, there are merely thousands, but soon more than a billion swarm all over the forest. The biggest insect emergence on the planet is underway. Look at these droves. We apologize in advance for any nightmares you might have tonight. They emerge at night for obvious reasons. All those things would attract a whole bunch of birds, but the birds they are sleeping. They invade the upper where they climb out of their external skeletons and assume their adult wing form. Yeah. At first, they're white and soft, but they have until dawn to complete their transformation. After an absence of 17 years, the forest is now overrun by cicadas. The adults are clumsy and very edible. <laughs> For turtles and other inhabitants of the forest, this is a feast they're lucky to see once in their lifetime, and they gorge themselves while they can. <laughs> Times have never been so good. 
the cicadas have no defenses and virtually offer themselves to their attackers. And I have to jump around. The stream of insects is so relentless that soon all the predators are full to the point of bursting. <laughs> and still the cicadas come. With the predators overwhelmed, the survivors can achieve their purpose. And that is one of the principal reasons After we think... After mating, the adults lay their eggs, oh, and then their job is done. In just a few days, they will all die, and the forest will fall silent. You can see the her using her beak there. Not be heard again for another 17 years. Okay. <laughs> Success. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let me continue with my um, uh, screen here, and I need to share. Uh... Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the periodical cicadas. And remember, that's 17 years up north, 13 years down south. Um, the, uh, the cicadas occur in this range here, and uh, this is a composite of all the record records of, um, of, the, of the 17 and the 13 years. The 17 years are about up here, and the 13 years are here. Um, the interesting thing is these occur in what we call broods. And you, I said uh, much earlier that it's brood 10 that's emerging now. And that brood is, um, is sorry, is, uh, I'm trying to get it so I can see what's going on here. Here we are. Uh, here is the brood that is coming out right now. And as I described to you, it's the ones with the blue, dark blue dots here. So here's Connecticut, Hudson River Valley, and Pennsylvania, mostly in the southeastern part, New Jersey, etc. Of course, that's where lots of people live. That's why there's so excitement about brood 10. But these other broods come out in different years. And uh, I won't, um, I can show you here just what that, um, that program is. Uh, but uh, here, so we're talking about the um, brood 10 now. And that's actually this brood up in the upper corner here of the um, chart. But what you see is a different brood here. This is number 13, which lives up in northern Illinois and Iowa. It's coming out there. And um, let me just reduce this a bit, and I will blow this up a little bit so you can see some details here. Um, so these are different broods. I will point out one other brood. There's actually 12 different broods of the 17-year locust. That means there's five years when no 17-year locusts are out. and uh, But somewhere every other year, there are some coming out. I thought I would point out to you brood, um, and let me see if I can find it here, brood, uh, yeah, brood seven here. That's the only other New York State brood, but it's very tiny. It occurs here now. It used to occur sort of in several counties up here. Now it's totally restricted to the Onondaga Indian Reservation, um, which is up near Syracuse, a very small area, but apparently the populations are very high there. And interestingly, um, they think that's because the Onondaga uh, maintain their older forests much better than all the surrounding uh, areas. This is a pretty agricultural area up here. And uh, so uh, once again, indigenous people are acting as uh, major guardians of some of our, uh, our best uh, environments here. And they have this one brood here. And that brood um, came out in 2018, won't be out again until 2035. 
Um, okay, let me go back down here a little bit and um, let's return to the full screen here and uh, let me, uh, so we have many broods, by the way, there's only three broods of the 13s, but that amounts to then 15 different broods, which come out in different years. Um, now, this is just a picture of what Magis Cicada really looks like. And, uh, you know, it looks quite different from the dog day uh, cicadas. Um, they're, um, I'll talk in a minute just about uh, why they uh, come out in such large numbers. But they probably don't have to worry much about predators because they're overwhelming them. Whereas our dog day cicadas are quite nice green color and so much better camouflaged. But these guys are black with red wings or orange wings and bright red eyes and uh, remarkable. Now, I'm going to tell you there's another complication which is fascinating too. And that is that within each brood, there are usually three different species. This was actually detected quite a while ago. Um, I remember when I first read about it about 20 years ago, it was just there was a hunch there was three species. But now, thanks to molecular uh, looking at the genes of uh, these uh, cicadas, we now know that actually there are three species in most of the broods. Now, here's the, the interesting part, which... Uh, which might be a bit, and by the way, don't worry about these uh, sort of symbols. What I wanted to show you was this branch here. These are all the one species here. These are all a second species, and these are all a third species. These apparently evolved, and people can tell this uh, because of the difference in genes, that they, they originated about one and a half million years ago. In other words, these originated from one species and became three about then. Um, but all of the broods came later. Now, just think about that. Uh, what that means is um, each brood has the three species, but they all uh, originated later. So why do they all the three species within one brood emerge together? Uh, and you, because you might say, well, they're different species, they're going their own way. Well, it turns out that it's much better for them if they synchronize their emergence. So each of these broods, um, the 17, uh, 15 broods that I talked about, um, has um, most of them have the three species. Apparently in some of them, one of the species has become extinct. But so kind of very amazingly complicated. Okay, now there's some of the big questions about these guys. <laughs> Obviously, how do they count the years? Um, you know, they haven't got a sort of stopwatch down there and they have, <laughs> or that sort of thing. Um, it turns out that probably they do indeed um, uh, count, the, uh, count the years, but the way they count it, remember, they're counting underground down there, so they can't see the weather, they can't see the sun. But what is uh, what they are uh, hooked into are the trees. And, of course, the trees are responding to the years, and, you know, they're sending down nutrients in the fall and taking them back up in the spring. And so it would, you might uh, think, that indeed what they're doing is looking at the tree cycles. As far as I know, there's only been one experiment that tested that. But what they did is they kind of speeded up. They got some um, nymphs in the lab and put them on trees, and they speeded up the cycles. And they speeded it up from 17 uh, years uh, to um, 16 years. In other words, they had 17 cycles in 16 years. And indeed, um, most of their uh, cicadas came out not in the 17th year, but in the 16th year. So it looks like that's what they're actually doing. Actually, the more experiments need to be done because they ended up actually with very few living. And that's probably what happens in nature. These great droves of, of um, cicadas making each making hundreds of eggs 
there must be an incredible sort of um, attrition of numbers in the ground so that relatively few actually survive to come out as adults. Relatively few, but that's still thousands. So um, now why the other sort of big question is um, uh, why do they um, all come out? Why don't they just come out every year anytime they like? Um, it turned, they are a wonderful meal, as you saw, for the predators. And so the idea is that they kind of oversaturate the predators. So many come out that the, that the predators all get saturated. And so, as David Attenborough said, the few that are relatively few that are left, which is still a lot, uh, get to mate and, and uh, produce young. Um, and it's therefore, if some do by accident come out in the wrong year, there aren't very many of them doing that, and they all get rapidly eaten. So what that does apparently is focus the whole cycle onto those that count 17 years accurately, or as I said, 13 down south. And uh, some other questions about them. Uh, do they do a lot of damage? They do the, uh, the adults uh, suck plant juices and they might set back the growth a year, but there's no permanent damage that people see. Um, the de when they all deposit eggs in twigs, the twigs die, but that's a little bit of damage. And when the nymphs go down into the roots, uh, people have actually experimented with this and found that actually they don't seem to hinder the development of the trees. Obviously, they're taking something away from the nutrition of the trees, but apparently not enough survive uh, to actually cause serious damage to forests. So um, if they did, they might, there might be a serious problem for the cicadas if they're eliminating all their trees, but they don't. And so, so this phenomenon does survive. And uh, so that's sort of what I have to say about the periodical cicadas. I wish I could say go here or there 60 miles south and find them, but I don't know particular locations. But uh, if you are down, particularly in the Hudson Valley, I know you can hear them and see them down there. And this is what uh, one very timely cartoonist uh, thought about this phenomenon. So... <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, very good. Okay, Andrew, <laughs> that's what I have to say and present. So um, I'd be very happy to take questions. So, all right. Uh, let's see here. Can you hear me okay? Can, can you hear me all right? Copernic Observatory. Calling Copernic Observatory. All right. <laughs> uh, hold on. Let's try that. Is, it, is that better now? Can you Actually, hear me? I don't. Can't hear you. Can't can't see you. I don't see you. Uh, no. Andrew. Okay. There we are. Wait a minute. Uh, I don't know why I lost my uh, video. Yeah, Earth to Copernic. Okay. This is well, what we're doing. you get you get to look at my icon, I guess. <laughs> um, well, okay. So uh, again, for those that are watching on the on the YouTube, um, actually, you don't get to watch. Yeah, you get to. Like, I'm not sure why it's not uh, why it's not working here. Um, hold on, let me just do one more. Yeah, you know, you're right. I, you're, you're not uh, Carol and uh, and Julian. I think we've all had our moments with uh, with IT issues yes. <laughs> today. So uh, uh, we're all in good company. Um, so I, a number of people have uh, expressed uh, thanks for uh, for the presentation, uh, Peter. Uh, Savridis, I think, this is an incredible, interesting lecture. I had the privilege of hearing Professor Shepard during an Earth Day panel. Didn't think I'd have the privilege to hear him again. So uh, you've got a, a fan base out there. Um, uh, trying to think here, what else? Uh, okay. Oh, uh, Denise asks a question. Uh, when the cicadas are in the ground, are they actually dormant, or are they moving around? And and how do they, <laughs> how do they last? How, you know, how how do you how do you not eat for 17 years? Uh, <laughs> um, the only thing I could guess at, frankly, I haven't seen anything on this, but what I would guess is they just eat slowly. I'm quite sure that they uh, don't sort of all eat at once and then rest for uh, 15 years or something like that. 
Um, but, uh, and I would guess they don't move around because they would have to do a lot of excavation, but maybe they do. Um, I haven't seen anything on that in the scientific literature, and uh, it's a little bit difficult to get down there and actually trace them, so ask the question, does one move around? So um, I we don't know that, I'm quite sure. Yep. All right. Um... I think I mean, I'm wondering also if it, you know, almost like how bears hibernate and that the metabolism just really slows slows down a lot and uh, that um, would be a very interesting thing to study. It's quite right. likely they do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of insects do that, of course, every winter. So. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's you know, like you know you you hear, you hear about uh, fish or amphibians that are frozen solid in in ponds and. Boom! They come. <laughs> Once it warms up, they they come back to life, and uh, so. Uh, well, I, I, I would just say that since they're south of here, they probably are below the frost line. You know, they're down in the sure. soil, and as right. you know, the frost only goes so far down into the soil. So right. they may not have the problem of freezing. It'd also be interesting to see if uh, over time, as uh, climate change. Appears to be, uh, you know, moving. Uh, mm -hmm. You know what wh what that does to, you know, the uh, you know the breeds. I mean, uh, will they in fact start migrating north? Uh, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, they don't have a high um, ability to migrate. They apparently can only fly sort of a couple miles. Mm -hmm. um, so it would take them time to get here. And I don't think they wouldn't have any other way of getting here. Right. I don't think anything carries them around. So, I mean, um, yeah, short, short of uh, uh, the eggs somehow managing to, to move elsewhere. And, uh, but, right, but, you, but you said actually the, the eggs, they actually just they, they emerge later in the, uh, in the year. So you would really have you know, to. Uh, um, you know, the, the young just drop to the ground and burrow right, in right, right away. Right, right, right. So, all right, so Cindy asks, can you explain why the prime numbers or what is the um, what is postulated about that? <laughs> yes. Um, well, if it's not a prime number, um, the argument is that that would lead to overlapping. Um, and uh, that might, uh, you know, if you have some variants, say that, um, let's say they're on a 12-year cycle mm -hmm. or... Um, and say that they, um, some of them come out at six years, um, that there would be too much um, to, that there would, wouldn't be enough coming out, and that therefore they would get snapped up by predators. And um, uh, the, um, I'm being a little vague here because I'm a little um, unsure of the ground, but, um, uh, but it does work out that, um, Predators uh, actually uh, have more difficulty queuing in on the prime numbers. Um, there actually is some experiments looking at the um, uh, the abundance of birds, and and it turns out that the abundance of birds does decline in the years. Surprisingly enough, it declines in the years that the cicadas are actually coming out, um, huh. and. Uh, so uh, they, the bird, the, basically the birds and uh, other predators can't sort of figure out this 17-year cycle, whereas they might be able to figure out an, an even-year cycle. That's the best I can do. All right. All right. I, I, again, I don't know if, if all the species of cicadas are, are like this, but the, the red eyes just seemed very unique. And is there something to... <laughs> You know the uh, the color of their eyes that is helpful or, or, or naturally selected toward toward that. Well, that's a nice question. Um, you know, our uh, of course our annual cicadas. Um, I prefer Dog Day because they're not quite annual, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, they of course have dark eyes. So um, I was just using the argument that. Um, the periodical say cicadas are so numerous they don't care what they look like. Yeah. A lot of yeah. them are going to get eaten anyway, but they're going to. Some of them are going to escape. Sure. But sure. Um, that doesn't answer the question of why they're red. Why not just be a little more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, camouflaged? But they, 
Uh, good question. Yeah, no, it, they, it's funny because they sort of actually stick out. Um, but yeah. but uh, also again, it, it's it's a sort of an interesting. Uh, uh, I, mean, I don't. Know if, I don't know, that's not the right behavior. Is not the right word, but uh, uh, that they have migrated to the point where they just create so many of them, realizing that they have little to no defense. So we may as well just make a whole bunch of them, and yeah. a whole, you know, and some of them will at least continue to you know to propagate. Uh, yeah. And sort of, some of those images were uh, were quite, uh, uh, I say, amusing. We you, you sort of see the you know the birds you know just sort of given up on eating. I was like, I've had enough. You know? Yeah, right. Like you know, down to the Chinese buffet. You know, yeah, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> so, Where's the Pepto Bismol? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Maybe that's the red. Maybe that's the red. It's the Pepto Bismol is the uh, in the eyes there. So. I was I was going to say that um, I have been studying these tree hoppers that are closely related. They're mm -hmm. way smaller. They're not periodical. They just live on plants, but they have very bright red eyes also. Mm. And they look at each other. I think th it's attractive to one another um, because they like those red eyes. And you can see them going head to head, staring into each other's eyes. It's quite romantic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Love your big red eyes. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, well, I, th I thank you both. I mean, it seems like you've you've uh, you've been very thorough in in, in your explanation, and um, uh, so I'm trying to think if there's any other uh, questions that might have had presented themselves. But I think you've really done a great job. Um, we've had people from uh, Wyalusing, uh, from Binghamton, Newark Valley, and uh, so it's mostly from from this area and. Uh, um, so again, for those of you who might be watching us for the first time, um, please um, hit, our, hit the subscribe button. Uh, this way, you'll uh, you'll be sort of alerted as to when we do live streaming. You can also go to our website and uh, sign up for our email list. We can uh, let you know what's what's going on. Uh, again, we get coming up um, actually at nine o'clock in about an hour or so. Um, it should hopefully start getting dark enough, and uh, Jeremy Cardi, our, our live stream astronomer, will strap a uh, a camera on one of our scopes and start doing some uh, uh, spring sky observing. Uh, next next Friday night is the Sky Warren Storm Spotter uh, 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 program, so uh, um, get to learn about what uh, what weather is coming and um, what to do about it. Uh, as far as uh, how do you, how do you keep safe and also how do you report it? I know that the uh, uh, the National Weather Service really does rely on individual spotters throughout the uh, area especially when we get into sort of you know severe weather like uh, uh, possible tornadoes uh, understanding like you know what's coming where like you know how large is the hail and and things along those lines actually well we do have a um, uh, another question here um, it says Good. what is the main macronutrient energy source for these cicadas uh, do you pronounce it cicadas or cicadas or well if you're British like uh yeah. David Attenborough, it's you a, say cicadas. All right. But if you're American, you say cicadas. Tomato, tomato. Exactly. Um, exactly. And it says, then, do they prefer anything in, uh, in particular? Do they have enzymes and intestines well, to break down the meat? Well, there's, um, when trees send things down to the roots, it's got a lot of sugars. It's got a lot, a uh, fair amount of amino acids, which are the components of proteins. Uh -huh. So they have that kind of nutrition coming to them. Um, and so that's uh, that's where they're getting it. They're they're getting a, a balanced diet. <laughs> All right, excellent. I would just like to add one comment that um, sure. what uh, your questions have brought up is that there's a lot of things still to look at, and that's still uh, you know that's a message for science. You know, we often think, oh, we know all the important things about, that are going on, but we don't. Uh, there's a lot of things out there. I must say that I make a joke to my students that studying 17-year cicadas is not a great project for a PhD <laughs> because if you mess up the one year they come out, you got to wait 17 years. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, exactly. Well, we do get another question here. This is if uh, if a brood is up by Lake Ontario, then the climate doesn't seem to be the reason they're not here in southern New York and New England, uh, northeast Pennsylvania. Absolutely, yeah. So um, I don't think there's any fossil. You know, we don't have a lot of fossils of insects anyway mm -hmm. uh, around here because they're not well preserved. But um, 
you know, they probably had broader, different ranges, you know, uh, 10,000 years ago. Um, but um, I would think, actually, that the glaciers might have wiped out a lot of things up here. Sure. And it's perhaps not remarkable that Scranton is just about as far south as the glaciers got. So perhaps that has something to do with it, too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, um, we'll... Um I guess we'll sort of wrap that up here. Uh, again, if uh, you joined us a little later, uh, uh, if you enjoyed the uh, event and uh, this evening, and you're in a position to uh, to help us out, uh, there's a, a donation uh, button down below. Uh, you can also go back into our YouTube channel and look at any number of our uh, previous live live streams. Uh, uh, last week we had uh, a pre presentation on going from alchemy to modern science. We've had Somebody talk about the Arecibo telescope and, and how it failed. Um, so it's uh, there's, there's always a lot of good stuff on our on a YouTube channel. We are hoping maybe by sometime in June or maybe even uh, or, or by Jul July to be able to actually start having people come back uh, for live you know for a live live program here. And then of course if it's if it's clear out, we will uh, invite you out at the end of the program to. Uh, do some live observing through our telescopes. So, uh, so thanks again for uh, for joining us this evening, uh, Professor Shepard and, and Miles. Thanks again for your time. Uh, it was a great and interesting. I certainly learned a lot, and uh, we'll uh, look forward to uh, perhaps a, another talk on another topic uh, in the future. All right. So thanks again, and have good. a good evening. Stay safe, and we're getting close to not having to wear the mask, but but stay safe. Yeah. So long. Good.